in 1938, a dirt road was built down the side of Grandfather Mountain, North Carolina. Through hemlock and spruce forests, it wound its way to the isolated mountain community of Carey's Flat. For the first time, the inhabitants of this little community could freely travel 30 or 40 miles to the city, although most of them preferred to stay at home, wrapped up in the early English practices of plowing and planting, harvesting, hunting and fishing, cider making, glasses boiling, and of course, distilling. The area is little changed today. The same dirt road winds across crystal clear streams laden with trout, down through thick forests inhabited by deer and bear, past the door of many a log cabin lived in by the resourceful mountaineer with his quaint Elizabethan speech. Old man Sam Coffey, 90 years old, has lived in Carey's flat all of his life. He can tell about many a log rolling, a banjo picking, or a coon hunt. He remembers the first cook stove in Carey's flat, brought in by mule from Charlotte, North Carolina when he was 17. Before that time, they cooked over the open fire in Dutch ovens and kettles. He dates events as before and after the flood of 1940 or 1918. He remembers his first pair of shoes when he was 12 made by his father and held together with maple pegs. He's helped his mother spin the flax and weave it into shimmy shirts. He remembers well when the only light at night was a torch made of pine, and when any man worth his salt could pick a little Cripple Creek or Cumberland Gap on the five-string banjo. Although much remains the same in Carey's flat, Times have changed, and when I asked old man Sam how he felt about the good old days, he replied, Well, in a way, a mess. Back then, no. You could lay down on anything, you could lay your tools down in the water, and when you went back, you find them. And there's nothing stolen or missing. You never hear them telling us. You'd really get a paper or something. Once in a while, someone would give you uh, papers where it come from Charlotte or Knoxville or somewhere, and you'd read of this here devil man, you know, stealing, it's stuff for that, but you know, they want none in the, in the country. Well, I kind of agree with old man Sam, and I'm reminded of the old song, all the good times have passed and gone.
just like I mourn for mine All the good times have passed and gone All the good times are over All the good times have passed and gone Little darling, don't you wait no more Just after the Civil War in 1866, a young man by the name of Tom Dula, D-U-L-A, killed a young girl called Laurie Foster just a few miles from Carey's flat. A posse was organized to track Tom down, and on the posse was Uncle Julius Coffee, the uncle of old man Sam. Old Sam remembers hearing his uncle tell about the experience. He helped Tony, man. Tom Dooley, you know, hunting for Laurie Foster, you know, and they found where she'd been moved twice, you know, and then they found her, and they tracked Dooley right on till they caught him, you know. After he was captured, he was taken to Statesville, North Carolina, where he was tried and hanged. Uncle Julius was there and heard Tom speak his last words on the scaffold. He said honestly to God he didn't harm a hair on her head. Uncle Julius is buried there in Carrie's flat. His first wife, who died in childbirth, is buried at his side, and the infant, who died one day after his mother, is buried in the same coffin with her. John Dula, the nephew of Tom, is also buried in Carey's flat and used to work with old man Sam. He worked with me for uh, over three years over here for the Whitener Lumber Company. Well, now, wasn't he the nephew of old Tom? Yeah, they, he was a kin in the family, but he would never talk about it much, you know, at all. You couldn't get no information out of John at all. <coughs> How come, you reckon? Well, I just don't know. There's a lot of people, you know, where they're connected up, ain't they gonna say nothing. A lot of people ain't gonna say nothing, no way. There was a great man by the name of Frank Prophet who lived on the north slope of Grandfather Mountain and whose house was in sight of the place where Tom Dula was captured. Frank knew more songs than any man in the mountains and is the man who was largely responsible for the popularity of the song, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Here then, played on a three-string Appalachian dulcimer, the traditional instrument of the mountains, and one made from scratch by Frank Prophet, is the original Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley.
with your Barlow pocket knife. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Hang down your head and cry. You kill Polari Foster. Oh boy, you're bad. particularly upsetting experience for the mountain folk. With his fierce independence, the mountaineer would fight to preserve the freedom of any man. But at the same time, his clannish feelings made him resent any outsider. The majority of the mountain people fought in the Union Army, and as old man Sam Coffey recounts, Two of my uncles was killed at Gettysburg. Uncle Pat and Uncle Cleveland was killed at Gettysburg. And they were fighting on which side? On the Republican side. Even today, the Southern Appalachian area is Republican. On the other hand, a few families fought with the Confederacy and often kin was pitted against kin. Some rugged characters took advantage of the confusion and became bushwhackers thundering and killing for their own personal gain. One such man was Keith Blaylock, who killed several men in Carey's flat in one day, and then he... But, well, let's, let's let old man Sam tell us about Keith Blaylock. Blaylock and Perkins, you know, they got come through, you know, and killed us through. They killed two up here, you know, under the rock at your cabin is what I was told. Well, I went on down there to the Globe and I stayed about two or three nights with the old man, Billy Coffee. Well, when they got ready to leave, they wanted to take a walk up to the old grist mill, old corn mill. Well, when they got him up there, they killed him and left him. Well, they went on back down and across the mountain to Upton. And him and the old man Boyd had a grudge at one another, somewhere or another. I don't know how the grudge was. But anyhow, he killed him. Well, he went yonder to what we call Sandy Flat near Blowing Rock. And he killed the old man Hanley that, that night. Well, as he made his round back down through the globe, he was wanting to kill old Jesse Moore. Well, Jesse saw him a-coming, and he'd done heard about the killing, you know, up there, killing Boyd and the old man Coffey. And Jesse got his gun, and the both come up. Keith had the old eight shooter, and Jesse Moore had the old-time hog rifle. 
and they both come up at the same time. Well, Jesse Moore's gun just fired first, and half of the ball caught in the muzzle of uh, Keith's old eight scooter, and the other half shot his eye out and come out right there in the corner. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, uh, oh. Uh, Keith fell, Jesse whirled uh, to run, and Keith's old hooter went off, shot him in the heel, and he come out in his foot. <laughs> so he is a cripple the rest of his days. Uh, he had all brown and carry the mail from, bring from Mulberry to Grove, you know, just about six, eight miles. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this brings to mind an old mountain song about the Civil War. But in this instance, the heroes joined the Rebel Army, and the name of the song is The Johnson Boys. the old and young with joy of the many deeds of them that was done by the johnson boys that was done by the johnson boys that was done by the johnson boys that was done by the johnson Johnson, boys are boys of honor, they knew how to court their maids, they knew how to hug and kiss them, step up pretty girls don't be afraid, step up pretty girls don't be afraid, step up pretty girls don't be afraid, step up pretty girls don't be afraid. Yes, the one universal custom associated with the most teasing and jesting is corking, or as we say in the mountains, sparking. Sparking was most difficult because of the watchful eye of the elders, so that any social event such as a church service or a funeral provided a ready opportunity to see your sweetheart. Night services at the church were preferred because the corking couple would get to walk home in the semi-darkness of the torchlight held by the girl's parents. Most courting took place in the girl's home, setting in the fireplace room, as we say, with the elders. Well, the old folks wouldn't let you out on the porch no more, you know, that hubris of your problem. And maybe one of them would set up, uh, she said, go to bed about 11 o'clock, big old fireplace, one end of the house nearly, uh, 
fireplace, you say? Yes, sir. <laughs> what would you talk about? Huh? We got we couldn't talk about nothing very much, you know, on account of a woman or old man wanna be a sitting there listening at. <laughs> I asked him if this didn't make propositioning kind of difficult, and he replied, Well, that just kind of like easing around and slipping around and getting a few words in edgeways, you know, where they couldn't hear it. That's a little boy, you know, or... <laughs> Do you remember courting your wife, how you met her, and so on? Well, yeah. I know we was up at Billy Gregg's down the upper highway, and we was out there dressing up and killed her for that morning. And old Aunt Mary Dillon, that is Billy's wife's sister, and my wife's mother, they was coming up for her, and my wife was, was with them, you know. And I said to the old man, Billy, I said, he, I said, old man, by God, yonder's my gal. Well, I just said it, you know, and he just laughed about it. Well, they told me it on me at dinner, you know. And sure enough, it worked out, and if you was mine. <laughs> but, Doc, as long as we stayed together, we stayed together about 55 years before she got disabled, had to leave home. I bet you we never jowered all put together ten minutes. She got mad about something, I went on about my business, and if I got so angry about something, well, she just went on, I'd laugh at you or something, that make me that much madder, and I'd just go on out, you know, we'd say a word. I guess we could all take a lesson from that. Well, that reminds me of an old courting song sung back in the mountains and it's called Little Liza Jane.
time-honored tradition in the mountains is whiskey making. It was much easier to transport a few jugs of corn liquor from the mountains to the town than it was to transport many bushels of shelled corn. Aside from the practicalities, though, I suppose that liquor just tasted better than shelled corn anyway. The fermented cornmeal, or mash, was placed in a copper boiler and heated, and the mixture of alcohol and water vapor coming off was condensed into liquor in the copper tubing, or the worm. The best liquor was called double run, in which the distillate from the first running was redistilled, increasing the alcohol content or the proof. Of course, there was double the chance of getting caught by the revenues by double running, so some resourceful soul invented the thump keg, a large wooden keg placed between the boiler and the worm, which resulted in liquor of almost as high proof as double run, but only one run. Old man Sam remembers the first individual who brought the thump keg into Carey's flat. McCurry, fellow McCurry from Wilkes County brought the first thump keg that ever come. And he's the one that started with molasses, you know, put it in and the place of sugar, you know. And that was the first thump keg I had. No I ever saw. The best liquor, though, was double run, wasn't it? Oh, Lord, yeah. Just every drop would completely burn up, and I bet you one-fourth wouldn't burn now. Not even as the government liquor. The government liquor, sorry, and old sugar it is now. An experienced distiller could tell the proof by the size of the bubbles which developed as the liquor dropped from the worm into the keg. They called the bubble the bead, and the, well, let's let old man Sam tell us all about it. By the bead. That, they had come on a running, as long as it was liquor, it'd be a little bright bead about the size of a bird's eye. Looked like just a little bead on top of coming, you know. But just as soon as they quit beading, they cut it off and then they run it on as long as they any strength, you know, <coughs> and call it backings. <coughs> well, to save them, the backings, jugged them up and saved them for the next run. Put that in the thump keg, wouldn't they, the backings? No, they didn't use thump keg then, put them back in the steel, you see. Or, you see, they saved all the strength, you know. Mm. Lord, fell out some liquor like that now, you sure have some. Well, the liquor may not be as good this day and time, but it's just as plentiful. Which brings to mind that old mountain song about moonshining and distilling, and goes back many and many a year. Wake up, darling Corey. <laughs>
I seen darling Cory, she was wearing a great big grin. The revenue man done caught her, but her liquor done him in. Wake up, wake up, darling Cory, what makes you sleep so sound? Well, as I, long as I knew old man Sam, if he said it one time, he said it a hundred, he said, Doc, don't bury me in no fancy clothes, bury me in my overhauls. And the night he died, his son called me, and I got up early in the morning, took the six-hour drive up to the mountains, and there we all gathered about noon around the grave on the creek bank of Anthony Creek. And uh, the old preacher called me up to say a few words, and I managed my way up through the crowd. They opened the casket, and there with his snow-white hair and a freshly long, uh, laundered pair of overhauls was old man Sam. I couldn't tell you what I said, but I wrote this song in memory of him. He's gone, he's gone. Oh, man, Sam has left us all. Bury me beside the creek and bury me in my overhaul. At a little old place called Carey's Flat on a lonely Side. For 95 years he lived his life And then Sam Coffee died He'd gone, he'd gone Oh man, Sam has left us all Bury me beside the creek And bury me in my overall I've had my share of woes, but one thing, boys, I'd ask of you, don't bear me in no fancy clothes. He's gone, he's gone, oh, man, Sam has left us all. Bury me beside the creek and bury me in my overhaul. heavenly hall but one thing sure we'll know him there he'll be wearing his overhaul he's gone he's gone oh man Sam has left us all bury me beside the creek and bury me in my own When he went out to Johnny Cash's for dinner, as I have many times, I was his only psychiatrist. Every night after dinner, he would pass around the guitar, and everybody would play their latest hit. Mine was the song, Goodbye, Son, Have a Good Day. I played it that night, and the next morning he called me and said, It's a great song. You need to record it. I don't do recitations, but look toward somebody like Tex Ritter or someone like this. But I never have recorded it, but I'm doing it here now for you. Goodbye, son. Goodbye, son. Have a good day. These were the last words I'd hear mother say. When I was a boy, and we start out the door. 
headed for school or to do some hard chore. My heart would be heavy and well, <laughs> I'd even be scared to face the big world. I felt, I felt so unprepared. But one person knew just how a boy thought. And she would be there and what comfort she brought. I can hear her voice now as I started my way. Goodbye, son. Have a good day. Goodbye, son. Have a good day. These were the last words I'd hear mother say. I can see her there now. family gathered round and our prayers had been said and the doctor was there and, and he wrinkled his brow your mother's bad sick and it can't be long now and just as it seemed that she'd gone through life's door she opened her eyes just once more these last words as, as she went on her way goodbye son have a good day goodbye son have a good day these were the last words I'd hear mother say Now that I'm grown and go down life's road, I'm often discouraged by my burdens load. But when the going gets tough and I'm about ready to fall, there is an old woman whose face I recall. I can hear her voice now in, in my mind's eye, following me out to tell me goodbye. With a smile on her face, my mind hears her say, goodbye, son.